Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Today is Friday, July 28th, 2023. Good to have you on board, everybody. I just got finished uh, briefing one of the groups of uh, the class of 2027 plebes here at the Naval Academy. Always exciting to see the plebes here at the Naval Institute and uh, kind of get to meet and, and talk to the next generation of naval leaders. Uh, today's episode is brought to you by the members of the Naval Institute. Since 1873, 150 years now, the members of the Naval Institute have been the foundation of everything we do, from proceedings to naval history, to USNI news, to professional books and conferences and events. If you enjoy the show, ring the bell, subscribe, recommend us to your friends, and become a member of the Naval Institute at usni.org forward slash join. All right, my guest today joining us from Northern Virginia is retired Navy Commander Paul Giara. He is the author of an article in the July issue of Proceedings titled, The Navy Needs Tactical Nuclear Weapons Again. It is one of the articles in the ongoing American Sea Power Project, which Paul and his friend, uh, Captain Jerry Roncolato, helped us envision and bring to life over the last couple of years. Paul, great to have you on the show. Thanks, Bill. It's hard for me to wrap my head around the class of 2027. Uh, it is me I mean, too. So two two things to that point, right? So uh, a few weeks ago was the 40th anniversary of my class's I Day, induction day at the Naval Academy. So I was, you know, wearing the white works and marching around here in the hot summer heat in the in the summer of 1987, 83, 40 years ago. Uh, and one of the plebes, uh, after I gave my uh, presentation, came up and introduced himself, Midshipman Fourth Class Hendrickson, whose father was a classmate of mine. So that's uh, kind of a neat uh, turn of events as well. But yeah, uh, you know, the fact that they're 40 years younger is, you know, it's a bit of a yikes to me. When they start introducing themselves as their, your, their, your grandfather was... <laughs> then you then you got something to talk about. Yeah, I agree. I agree. All right. Well, so uh, you know, interesting uh, confluence of events here happening. Um, you know, the Oppenheimer, the movie about the uh, uh, the chief scientist for the Manhattan Project, who uh, you know brought the atomic bomb to life in uh, in 1945. Uh, that movie is out. That's one of the summer blockbusters. Uh, a U.S. Navy SSBN, Ballistic Missile Submarine, Ohio class, uh, uh, recently visited uh, South Korea or is, or is visiting South Korea. Um, there's lots of talk about a new Cold War. Of course, the ongoing war, uh, Russian aggression in Ukraine and the NATO's reaction to it. So there's a lot going on and a lot of that touches on or is or directly uh, is about the topic of nuclear weapons. So what urged you to write the article? Well, as you know, I wasn't going to write the article, and I ended up writing it uh, for various reasons. But um, in the in the planning of the American Sea Power Project, we're thinking of three phases, the ends, ways, and means of American sea power. And when the war in Ukraine started, in short order, uh, part of that was Putin rattling the nuclear saber. And so it occurred to us that, OK, this issue has got to be part of whether and how the Navy uses nuclear weapons, not the strategic nuclear weapons, of course, which is a key continuing mission, but the tactical nuclear weapons, which had been withdrawn. And then subsequent to that, I found not only that it was important to write the article, but it became much more complex than I expected. And in my research uh, because the research was really part of it, uh, uh, discovering certain things. What 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 loomed most large in my mind was what Admiral Richard said about the escalation and assurance gap that it, that um, existed. And and until I did my research, I, I hadn't known that. And that hasn't been publicized nearly enough that he said that because he was the commander of the strategic command. Right. Admiral, Admiral Chaz Richard, recently retired Navy four star, who was uh, commander of U.S. Strategic Command. Right. And that resonated uh, with me with regard in particular to things that Asian Northeast Asian allies are saying about our nuclear security guarantees, the nuclear umbrella, the 
which is really fundamental to our alliance structure, not only uh, in, in Asia, but in Europe as well. So there are a lot of things that were coming together in the writing, and then it just kind of fell into place. I mean, part of this background, personally, is I was a nuclear weapons delivery pilot and participated in a nuclear weapons test uh, in the 1970s. Um, nuclear weapons were a big part of the Navy. I participated in that. I took uh, at face value that this was something that was at the time necessary. And then the U.S. went through a post-Cold uh, War uh, um, rethinking of that. And it was a time when that was not only possible, but I think reasonable. Uh, Russia was weak. China was weak. Other countries hadn't emerged as, as the problems that they had become. And so President George H.W. Bush uh, withdrew tactical nuclear weapons from almost everywhere. There are a few left in Europe, as you know, and uh, under, under dual key control of, between the United States and some of our allies. But uh, given the new circumstances of what appears to be a new Cold War, certainly in my opinion it is, um, and in regard to both Putin's nuclear saber rattling, but also the Chinese nuclear breakout, which is really quite uh, eye-watering, then it brings to mind, well, should the U.S. reconsider its early 1990s uh, decision to withdraw tactical nuclear weapons? And Admiral Richard's comment about this gap uh, connects the dots because what he says is that you have this escalation gap that you can't go from nothing to 100 miles an hour. You have to have something in between, and that's tactical nuclear weapons. Our allies certainly understand that and have been very uncomfortable for a long time about that and now are quite outspoken about that. Uh, not only, but in particular in Seoul and Tokyo. And, you know, we don't have to do what our allies say. I mean, you know, you certainly want to, however, take into account uh, what they say, and especially when their feelings about alliances with us have to do with our guarantees with regard to nuclear weapons. And so that, and then the, the falling apart of the Budapest Memorandum, which guaranteed Ukrainian uh, security in the face of American, British, and Russian uh, actions to the contrary. In the context of the withdrawal of the, the ex-Soviet nuclear weapons from Ukraine. So this whole thing put together says, wait, this is not right. At least in my mind, this is not right. We've got to reconsider what to do. Yeah. So that's a terrific 30,000 foot or maybe 100,000 foot perspective. So let's just let's take that apart a little bit, starting with a uh, new Cold War. And uh, your your article tends to I mean, you mentioned Russia and China. And um, uh, but there's a little bit more emphasis, at, rightly so, on uh, particularly for naval issues on the Western Pacific and on, on China. So part of, you know, one of the things your article uh, mentions is that uh, there's a lot of uh, evidence that the Chinese are rapidly building up their nuclear arsenal across at, at multiple levels, not just, um, you know, silos for ICBMs with, you know, megaton sort of uh, class of weapons, but also at the tactical nuclear weapon level. So talk about that a little bit. So clearly our adversaries haven't haven't given up on this class of weapons. Oh, not at all. Uh, first, let me let me uh, stipulate that in my mind, this is not um, a, a Western Pacific issue any more than the U.S. Navy is a Western Pacific issue. So I just want to clarify that this has to do with our relationship with the rest of the world in the rest of the world, not just in the Western Pacific. But that said, um, there are numbers of things about China that loom large. First is I personally, th this is an unclassified um, article and my research is unclassified. My knowledge is unclassified. But I have never believed the longstanding um, estimate that China had 300 strategic nuclear warheads in its arsenal. Never believed it. Um, 
if you if you follow the work of Professor Phil Carber uh, with uh, analyzing the the underground uh, racetrack uh, for Chinese tells with strategic nuclear weapons, uh, it's a very large complex, much larger than anything that could be explained by 300 nuclear weapons. So put that aside because that's on my part speculation. And not, you're, you're, you're saying that you think that was a gross underestimation I, I, that's of exactly the right. Chinese arsenal. So, yeah. so that's the first thing. That's st strategic weapons. Now, if you connect that with what was clearly meant to impress everyone, which is China's quite visible nuclear breakout and the building of uh, missile silo fields in Chinese deserts, um, that is part of the, the equation as well. And then as far as tactical nuclear weapons, you have to do a little bit of reading between the lines. So in the, as an example, in the Chinese nuclear, uh, excuse me, Chinese military power report that is uh, published every year by DOD in the 2022 version, there are allusions to Chinese strategists talking about. They don't say that China has uh, these weapons, but that Chinese strategists are talking about. I think that's the best they could probably do, either because it may be limited by their knowledge, literally, or they were loath to talk more about it because it would give away what we know, which is an issue, of course. So all of the kinds of weapons that we've been thinking about in the tactical sense in the A2AD enterprise that China has mounted against the U.S. Navy, have those weapons have dual use capabilities. So um, this brings me back to thinking about the application of nuclear weapons at sea, and this is only one aspect of what we're talking about here, uh, during the Cold War, where a, a tactical nuclear weapon was meant to be a gap filler between uh, sensor and weapon accuracy in the first place. So that if you could get close enough to it that you could attack it, but you weren't sure that your conventional weapon, your airdrop torpedo, for instance, in my case, was going to be sufficient against a double hull Soviet submarine, then you would have to use a nuclear weapon to ensure a kill or if your sensors weren't good enough and you could get close enough for the weapon employment in the first place, then you'd have to use a nuclear weapon. And typically, you know, I don't know because it never came to that point, but I would, especially if this was against uh, Soviet SSBNs where the, the stakes were so high. So now you bring into the current context, the issue of weapons that can reach out and touch the US Navy but one is always war wondering about the end game, whether or not the weapons can actually hit a moving target at sea, for instance. But if the sensors are good enough to get the weapon in close enough, then the implications of the value and utility and application of Chinese tactical nuclear weapons to the same kind of problem set is pretty obvious. So that's, I think, where the Chinese probably are now with regard to tactical nuclear weapons that, that, that because the issues are pretty much the same. Yeah, it's a good point. Uh, so, operationally. Yep. Yeah. You were commissioned in the seventies. I was commissioned in the eighties. You mentioned as a P3 pilot participating in a quality assurance test of a nuclear weapon. Now that, that wasn't an actual, fission event, right? It was that, uh, That's correct. The, 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 that, the fission warhead was removed with, and a test package put in, and it was basically to test the fusing of the weapon, because in a nuclear weapon, at least in American nuclear weapons, you want to make sure it doesn't go off when you don't want it to go off, which is a function of the fusing, and you want to make sure that it does go off when you want it to go off, which is likewise the, the fusing issue. So... And one of the things I don't I don't know, um, you know, for generations who were commissioned or entered the services, you know, in the mid to late 90s and beyond. So much of the, the force today um, might not know that nuclear weapons were really ubiquitous uh, in, in the force at the time. So as you mentioned, you know, you were a P3 pilot. So that was the, um, you know, the ASW mission, MPRA mission. 
Uh, my first tour was uh, TAC Air on, uh, on an aircraft carrier. So I was a squadron intelligence officer. I was also involved in, um, you know, the personnel reliability program. We did, we had to do nuclear weapons planning drills and load drills on F-18s and A-6s. Uh, you know, surface Navy ships had, um, you know, you, you couldn't confirm or deny at the time, but we had uh, nuclear weapons on our surface Navy uh, ships as well. Submarines had, you know, nuclear tip torpedoes and anti-submarine rockets. So as rock, um, it was, there were, that was a time period and the Russian Navy, the Soviet Navy also had, had, had that, the, the story of the, uh, the uh, Soviet Foxtrot submarine in the Cuban missile crisis that almost fired a nuclear tipped torpedo at uh, U.S. forces in the Atlantic during that uh, that standoff is absolutely hair raising, and um, I, I mentioned in my editor's page of the July issue that we we don't raise this issue in proceedings. We don't we don't publish this with a rah rah nuclear weapons are great mindset. This is um, this is a sobering uh, topic. It is a difficult challenge. There's lots of um, you know issues with it. But as you pointed out, you know, at the end of the Cold War, the Soviet Navy kind of went home to, to rust at its peers. The United States um, singularly, singularly, yeah, let me say that again, singularly, mm -hmm. um, you, you, you know, unilaterally, unilaterally we, uh, we disarmed from this class of weapons. We took those weapons off Navy ships and, uh, you know, off the aircraft and submarines, et cetera. Uh, and so we've operated for the last, you know, really almost 30 years now without them and, or more than 30 years now without them. Um, and so um, your article brings this up. You know, there's some some of the history, but we're looking at what the Chinese are doing or thinking about doing. And, and the, the Russians never really got out of that business, as, you know, uh, Putin's saber rattling in Ukraine has uh, has demonstrated. And so that was you know, why with the American Sea Power Project, we said this this topic, at least we need to raise this topic. It's a very important topic. Um, I wanted to ask you to, because you mentioned Admiral Richard and you mentioned that escalation ladder, um, just talk a little bit more about that, um, The you know, what that means, you know, uh, the, the, the idea of to, if you don't have tactical nuclear weapons, you're missing a rung on an escalation ladder. Explain that a little bit. Well, nuclear weapons have sort of an intrinsic uh, disaffection for everyone, or at least most of us. And I, and I want to associate myself with your, your sobering description of this issue. And I agree. I'm not, I'm not happy about having to write about this. But I am, I think, a realist, and I'm not afraid to raise the issue. But um, so there is a built-in reluctance to use uh, nuclear weapons, there's an expectation that the use of tactical nuclear weapons would likely result in escalation. So there's a natural sort of holdback, unless you are somebody like Putin, who is, uh, I presume, thoughtfully uh, threatening the use of nuclear weapons. When I say thoughtfully, with knowing full well what he might be getting himself into. So there's a natural holdback. If you don't think about these things in advance, then there's absolutely no possibility of using these weapons. And so one of the things I've tried to do in the article is, is raise these issues. And in fact, I've used an example uh, in the article of the Navy getting ahead of something that, which at the time was literally illegal, which was unrestricted uh, submarine warfare. So this is an example, and, and the development of unrestricted submarine warfare, as has happened numbers of times uh, in the history of the nation, the Navy's strategies and suggestions and operational capabilities have shaped national policies and strategies. And in this case, it was to enable us to blockade, impose blockade on Japan in the Pacific uh, to an extraordinary extent, which was uh, war shaping and I think war winning. So the issue of raising, it, uh, raising this notion of tacti tactical nu 
nuclear weapons. Thinking about it now, it's not politically acceptable now. It's not. Uh, and I'm, this is not meant to be a political statement about an individual administration. It's, it's not politically acceptable because counterproliferation and nonproliferation are sort of the watchwords of the day. Unfortunately, they've, I think, been pretty much failed. I mean, I think that proliferation has, is in the ascendance and we have to respond to that. But and, and that's gone back, you know, over multiple um, administrations, you know, Republican and Democrat, right? For the last, you know, since we got rid of tactical nuclear since weapons, the end of the Cold War, since the end of the Cold War, the focus, uh, you know, the, the focus on nuclear weapons from the U.S. government has largely been on counter proliferation, on stopping the spread of nuclear weapons and and slowing down the spread or stopping preventing it to countries such as North Korea, Iran, etc. Right. So. What you don't want to do is you don't want to be in a position where people will say, well, it's obvious that the Americans will not use nuclear weapons. So on the, in the first instance, having tactical nuclear weapons makes it maybe a little bit more palatable and feasible. Uh, many have made that point. Um, on the other hand, you want them you don't want your allies to think that and you don't want your enemies to think that we will not use nuclear weapons. You don't want to put yourself in that box. And I think we're in that box. So um, on the other hand, you do want your enemies and your allies to think, well, maybe they will. Now, I don't mean to say that we should declare we will because we've never done that, but we have always reserved the right of first use uh, the various presidents, if they've chosen to, have expressed their their determination to never let the this was during the Cold War to never let the Soviets know what they were thinking. So that's fair. But on the other hand, as a practical matter, as institutions, organizations, and and as as a nation, you have to get ahead of this, both intellectually and and then ideologically and politically, but also practically. So there's a lot of thinking to do, as an example, of the practical ramifications of this. Um, where would you put them? How would you mount them? How would you command and control them? How would you uh, vouchsafe for their security? And not just with the fusing, but the command and control and access. Training, training access. And education, and right. All that stuff. There, there are lots of practical and political considerations that have to be considered. I don't think for a moment that we're ready to do this. What I mean to say, though, is we're sort of pushing on an open door with this issue, where the unfortunately, again, to underscore that un unfortunate aspect of this, that I think the time has come to, to re not only reconsider, but to redeploy nuclear weapons. Slickum N is an obvious example of some people are thinking about this uh, as it Turns out, ship so, launched, submarine launched, cruise missile, nuclear, surface, sea launched, or surface, sea launched. Sea sea launched. launched. Yep, can and be so, either either from a submarine or from a surface ship. Right. Although, and this is important now, uh, although primarily thought of as a submarine weapon. Now, one of the issues of nuclear weapons at sea during the Cold War is that that deployment not only in submarines, but in aviation squadrons and surface ships, changed, among other things, changed the whole character of the surface fleet. Um, and this culminated in what's called Akramayev's map. When Marshal of the Soviet Union, Akramayev, their senior military man, visited Admiral Crow in the very late 1980s, when Admiral Crow was chairman of the Joint Chiefs, he presented the Admiral with what he called what has come to be known as Akramayev's map. And it showed from the Soviet perspective what we had done to the Soviets by surrounding them with firepower. This was nuclear firepower. And Tomahawk range arcs are part of that construct, nuclear Tomahawks during the Cold War. So this was, this had a profound effect on the Cold War and the way it ended and it put tremendous firepower pressure on the Soviets. This was part and parcel of a much larger political 
initiative to reintroduce uh, ground launch cruise missiles and Pershing nuclear arm intermediate range missiles into Europe. It was part of pushing the Soviets on this nuclear issue, which had much larger implications and results. So this is all part of the, the role that nuclear weapons can play because they loom so large psychologically, uh, but they lend themselves to a whole variety of purposes, deterrence, reassurance, assurance, and so on. Yeah. And uh, more recently, I would point out, and it's not in your article, but there's been discussion about whether or not it is or is not uh, the Gerasimov doctrine. So that's the, uh, uh, the, the essentially the, the senior military officer in the Russian military now, uh, Gerasimov, General Gerasimov. Um, but the, there's been uh, a lot of discussion over the last five or six years, including some in our in our pages, about the the Russian doctrine or thinking about escalate to de-escalate, which would be to use nuclear weapons, understanding that they are that their uh, conventional forces are relatively weak compared to NATO. Would the would the Russian armed forces escalate to use nuclear weapons, tactical nuclear weapons, in order to stop a war or in order to de-escalate a situation. So that escalate to de-escalate uh, topic has been debated and academics will probably you know, reach out and correct me um, as they should. But that discussion about how the Russians might use nuclear, this was before the Ukraine invasion, how the Russians might use or think about using nuclear weapons in, in that context is also I think very um, uh, applicable to this conversation. I think so, because in part, this is a response, of course, the, this is what started the whole conversation, a response to uh, uh, Russian nuclear saber rattling. But on the other hand, I, I am approaching this, uh, you know, ultimately it becomes literally a firepower issue. Okay, but let's think about everything that occurs sort of left of that, right? And I believe in escalating to de-escalate in the sense of deterrence. So the perfect examples of that were Glickham, the ground launch cruise missile, and Pershing II, where President Reagan escalated to de-escalate. He escalated in order to take control of the nuclear weapons dialogue with the Soviets and with our allies. And so part of what I'm proposing is that in it, to do this so as to exactly that, to escalate from a low point of, of vulnerability to something equating to, if I can even describe it that way, some sort of operational and strategic and tactical parity. But you escalate in order to get people's attention as a deterrent issue. Now, some would argue, well, it just makes things worse. These are some of the kinds of discussions that are going to have to ensue about this because uh, right-minded, if not like-minded people are going to have to discuss these, debate these issues and so on. Um, and so I'm, I'm hopeful that, that this kind of writing will enable those kinds of conversations. I don't for a moment think that I have all the answers, but I, I, can, I do think I can introduce some of the issues. I, I remembered a, a very poignant story when I was a boy and uh, my, I was probably eight or 10 years old and used to wrestle with my father, right? And, uh, you know, wrestling with him in, in, in good fun and jest, uh, you know, sometimes it would escalate a little bit. And, and I remember getting frustrated with him one time and uh, getting ready to, to hit him. And he said, stop. And he said, you can hit me, but if you hit me, I'll hit you back twice as hard. And uh, and I remember pausing and I went like this, tap, and he went, bam. And then I, I went, I went, tap, and he went, bam. And I was like, ah, I, I see where this goes now. And and so we, we de-escalated immediately. But that story, as we were working on your article, uh, it's a very simple analogy, but it's one that it, it you know it, it worked for me and it just reminded me of that point in my you know right. a, a lesson learned from a uh, from a dad to a son. But um, Paul, I also wanted to I want to bring up a point. Uh, so later in your career as a naval officer and then uh, post Navy, so you went to the, the Japan Self Defense College um, and got a master's degree in Japan. 
and then you worked in Japan and, and in the Pentagon and you managed the strategic relationship with Japan. And you've spent time after your uh, retirement from the Navy very focused on our allies in the Western Pacific. And so a key part of your article is about that, about how our allies, particularly Japan, are looking at the relative nuclear strength and the relative naval strength also of the United States versus China. And so I, I'd like you to talk about that aspect because there, there's a sidebar with your article uh, that you also wrote, uh, but it breaks this out because the, the, in Japan and also in, in Seoul, um, our allies are having very interesting conversations about the relative strength and the willingness of the United States to extend our nuclear umbrella to protect them. So describe that a little bit. Um, sure. Um, as I said earlier, we don't always have to do what our allies say, but we have to take pretty seriously what they say and listen to them. And, and I think it's very valuable to hear this from the perspective of allied capitals. And what the South Koreans and the Japanese, and there's more to the world than South Korea, Japan, and Northeast Asia, but what the Japanese and the South Koreans are saying, who have literally prospered under our nuclear umbrella as a result of our nuclear security guarantees during the Cold War and, and subsequent, because those guarantees have never been withdrawn, is they're saying to us, in as clear a way as they can bring back or introduce to our country American nuclear weapons. Um, so th the way they're doing this is in the press, uh, number one. And number two, in Japan, uh, in a way that rings loudly in my mind, because this is the way Jap Japan does business, in a commission, an unofficial commission, uh, headed by a former um, Japanese general who was their chief of staff, chairman of the Joint, Ch Joint Staff Council, General Oriki. And his commission said these things quite literally. It said, bring back American nuclear weapons and so on. Now, the, the issue before us is, first, we, like with Ukraine in the Budapest Memorandum, we should not make this mistake again. So we made a terrible mistake with the Ukrainians, and now here we are, right? So the, our allies are saying they've never used Budap the word Budapest in their writings, as far as I know. But uh, in other words, they're not referring to that mistake. But on the table is, don't make that mistake with us. We really depend upon you. However, the alternative is, they're not saying this literal. Uh, they're not saying this out loud, but, well, actually some of them are, but not officially. We can have our own nuclear weapons too. So far, we've always had a nuclear weapons program. It happened to have American insignia on the side. Uh, but we had it. And so we want to we want to continue that arrangement if possible, but if not, and then there's a dot dot dot, because the South Koreans had a nuclear weapons a covert nuclear weapons program. Uh, President Carter forced them to with, to back out of that. He he literally threatened to withdraw American troops from the Korean Peninsula. Uh, and Japan can have a, its own nuclear weapons program. One of the footnotes in my article recounts that a very senior Japanese diplomat out of the clear blue, while we were having a drink together in Tokyo, uh, I was long out of the Navy, and, and uh, but he was still in government service. He said, out of complete, out of context, he said, you know, all this talk about Japanese, Japan having nuclear weapons in a month because that's the sort of the, the basic working estimate that there's this tacit capability already there. That's ridiculous. It would take us at least six weeks. And so, you know, he was, he was trying to tell me something. I, I took it that way at the time. Uh, and so I included it as, as one of the footnotes. So there are these realities 
uh, in Northeast Asia and elsewhere. So either we're going to reintroduce our own nuclear weapons or foster uh, allied combined nuclear weapons programs as we do in Europe, or we're going to have to live with a very uneasy coexistence of national nuclear weapons programs in Northeast Asia that are, that include not just North Korea, but South Korea and Japan and so on. Uh, and you can imagine that spreading like wildfire elsewhere because uh, these will be uh, examples uh, set down by the Japanese and the South Koreans. Now, there's a lot that will happen between now and then, but it, the Japanese are moving out distinctly and smartly. And so they're going to buy 500 Tomahawk land attack cruise missiles from the United States. Land attack cruise missiles. Now you combine that with a tacit nuclear weapons program, and this is meant to put the Chinese in a bind, but it raises the issue of the role and the ubiquity of tactical nuclear weapons and who has them, who controls them and so on in Northeast Asia uh, to a level that has never ever been considered before, let alone dealt with. And so these are, these are serious uh, ramifications and implications of, let's say, um, American reticence with regard to nuclear weapons. There, there, is an there is a cost to wanting to back away from this kind of American nuclear weapons posture or, or restore it to what it was when it was obvious. It was clearly a consensus view that it was necessary. So th there are prices to be paid for choices. And my, my suggestion basically is we have to rethink those choices and decide what to do next. Yeah, I think my key takeaway from your article is that whether the United States wants to talk about this topic or not, it is being discussed. It's being sure. discussed sure. in both our adversaries' uh, capitals and militaries, as well as our uh, mm -hmm. our key allies' capitals and militaries. And that that is a, a really good point. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, you know, we could probably talk another half hour or more. The but we're about out of time, and uh, this is a it's it's a sobering article, but it's a very insightful article. Uh, it's titled, The Navy Needs Tactical Nuclear Weapons Again. It's in the July proceedings, starting on pages 68 and 69. The author is Commander Paul Giara, U.S. Navy retired. Paul, thanks for your time today for, for writing this article and also for your time and uh, being on the show today. Sure, Bill. It's a pleasure to have written the article, to appear with you today, and to work with you closely at the Naval Institute. All right. Well, re, re, uh, just a reminder, this this episode, every episode is brought to you by the members of the Naval Institute. If you're not a member, you can join at usni.org forward slash join. Our members since 1873 have been the foundation for the free and open forum that is the Naval Institute. And until next week, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute.